It seems that all of life today is a pursuit of something to complete us. Perhaps it's always been the human condition, but it seems to be especially amplified in a world of never-ending noise and distractions. Where do we look? What can we trust? Can we really find that which fulfills the irrepressible longing of our souls? Father Justin Braun, chaplain at the St. Philip Institute of Catechesis and Evangelization, explains how the Eucharist is what orients us towards true and lasting happiness. This is Sangreal. Hello, I'm Paul Teese, your host, and in today's episode, I was joined by my good friend, Father Justin Braun of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas. In the discussion that follows, Father Justin talked about his experiences in teaching young people about the reality of Christ present in the Eucharist, why being quote-unquote spiritual but not religious is not enough, and how the Eucharist answers the deepest held existential questions that burden the human heart. So we are talking today with Father Justin Braun of the Diocese of Tyler. Just to kind of jump right in, got a, got a softball question for you. <laughs> How does the Eucharist fill a void that nothing else can? Well, thanks, Paul, for uh, reaching out. and It's a great joy to share a little bit about our Lord and the Eucharist. Uh, so I, I want to go to scripture real quick actually and just mm -hmm. two two things from scripture and then talk a little bit more about it so in genesis 1 1 we read in the beginning when god created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form or shape with darkness over the abyss and a mighty wind sweeping over the waters then god said let there be light and there was light so we begin there we just kind of realize that some of the texts say even that uh the earth was void uh that there was there was not anything um so we realize that god creates something rather than nothing so we we make this essential and existential move from nothingness to somethingness mm -hmm. um and that that was put into motion by our lord from on high and then we we look to john 1 uh 1 through 5 the prologue it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god all things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So clearly the sacred author, St. John, was aware of the Genesis story and wanted to kind of, as, as he even does in Apocalypse and, and the book of Revelation, kind of recapitulating all of creation the beginning with the marriage, the creation of mankind, the marriage of Adam and Eve to the end, the marriage of the wedding at the wedding feast of the lamb, that in the midst of that, there's this common theme that God enters into our order. He enters into the world. And uh, the question of filling that void, you know, the people kind of commonly say there's a God size or a God shaped hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, our Lord became flesh and as the, the translation actually goes, pitched a tent among us, like, which harkens back to the whole, you know, story of Israel and wandering through the desert, mm -hmm. uh, that our Lord, there was a, a tent, tent, you know, literally where our Lord's commu Lord communicated with Moses, that this notion that lo the Lord wants to communicate intimately with us mm -hmm. uh, is so biblically founded that it's, it's kind of crazy to not see it. So the Lord enters into the reality of the human situation through the incarnation, right? That the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we recognize that, okay, not only am I aware of this kind of at an existential standpoint, that I thirst for God, I long for this kind of void to be feel, filled, but that not only has God heard that and communicated with us from the beginning, you know, through his prophets, through his uh, his kings, through through the ancient authors, but but that desire to communicate with us became flesh in the person of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and that our Lord himself, at the Last Supper, instituted the means by which he would remain with us, sacramentally present to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity throughout the ages, and so it is no surprise to me that people have this longing, particularly in our Catholic context, they're looking for that meaning. What is, what is it that I'm searching for? I'm searching for that wholeness to be with God and to feel 
because it is important that our heart feels this, but also to know that our Lord is near us. And so the Eucharist takes on all of that, that beautiful history of creation, that beautiful history of man's disassociation with our Lord through the fall and makes present to us that reconciliation and that remedy through the gift of the Lord, of our Lord in the Eucharist. And so the Eucharist intimately fulfills our creaturely needs, mm-hmm. our, 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 we know that we're made, you know, with senses. He comes to us in the veil of bread and wine because we couldn't handle the reality of, of, of flesh, but he also fulfills our spiritual needs and our psychological needs. He fulfills the, the, that hole in our heart that needs to be filled with only with God only. Uh, and the only thing that can truly satisfy. So hopefully that gives you some idea of what I'm, I'm thinking about. Yeah, I know. And it's, and it's interesting because you, you mentioned the, the intimacy of the relationship and it's, you've got to, with the Eucharist, it's a challenge because you either, you can see it with the eyes of faith or you can't. And, you know, so like two quotes that, that kind of leapt to mind as I was listening to you. One comes from uh, uh, St. Augustine. Uh, and I may butcher the quote, but it's along the lines of, you know, my heart is restless until it rests in you, Lord. Yep, right. Yep, so the there's, confessions. you can, you know, you can look across all of creation, but you're never going to be satisfied until you recognize that your heart is oriented to relationship with God. Right. And then the other quote comes from, from Friedrich Nietzsche, who says, and I think this is like from beyond good and evil or something like that, but he said something along the lines of, you know, you stare into the abyss and the abyss stares back at you. And Mm. I think what he meant by that, if I remember my college philosophy course was that it was that kind of immensity of solitude of human solitude in the universe. And it's just, it's, you know, for him, it was kind of like trying to deal with, you know, the, the challenge of humanity was trying to deal with the, the existential anxiety that that produces. But so yeah, it's like, you've, you've got two sides of a coin. It's like, are you going to be in relationship with something greater than yourself? Or are you going not to? And, you know, so it's like, it's incumbent upon us to, to give a yes to that relationship. And God, all love, won't force it on us, right? Right. Right. And and if I don't, if you don't mind, I'm just going to speak to that a little bit. Like Mm -hmm. people often wonder about why our Lord comes to us in in the veil of bread and wine. And and I, I, I I like to think about the saints who have experienced uh, visions of heaven, but also even the kind of near death experiences. Uh, Father Robert Spitzer, I don't know if you know who he is, but he, he wrote a series of, of kind of, books that, that are dealing with some of the big existential questions. And one of the things he did is kind of a deep dive on all the um, near death experiences. And, and one of the things that was consistent in that conversation, uh, but was also consistent with the vision of the saints is that the immensity of God mm-hmm. compared to the littleness of man, like we, re- we really can't fathom when, when for you and I, a shared experience of tremendous sorrow was, was nine 11. We couldn't imagine, like literally before that day, you and I as red-blooded Americans could not imagine what is, you know, the iconic symbol of American capitalism, the Twin Towers in New York and Lower Manhattan Mm -hmm. coming down because it just was so beyond us. Mm -hmm. And then it became flesh and it became real. And we were able to comprehend the evil of, uh, of genocide, the evil of, you know, tyrannical tendencies. And so... In a little way, it's a diff, very different kind of exposure, but in, a, in an analogical way, mm-hmm. our Lord's immensity as our creator and as a divine lover who loves perfectly, like even the best of human loves, pale in comparison to the, the love that our Lord has for us. And so for our Lord to humble himself just as he was born into a, a crib and he died in the ignominious igno- death on, on two sticks, our Lord is always keenly aware that he he will come to us humbly because if he overwhelmed us, we wouldn't know what to do. We would just not, we would die of joy as St. John B. says. Mm. So um, what is one of the most inspiring Eucharistic stories you've ever heard? Okay. So I'm going to tell you just a little witness, uh, something I've seen that I, that, that I was part of because I think, you know, normal, 
day-to-day stories in some ways can be very impactful. So mm-hmm. one is just first communions. Like there's not a, I, I can't think of a, a big aha moment. We're going through kind of first communion cycle right now with our parish this past weekend. We brought 15, we had confirmation and first communion and this young woman uh, who's maybe 10 years old and just was in tears, in tears, receiving her first Holy Communion. It, it moved me to tears. I was like, this is, this is the faith I wish I had. I'm saying mass, you know, usually once, if not twice a day. Mm-hmm. And, and I think about the rarity of which I moved to tears. And I'm like, gosh, I, God's in my hands, literally. So there's, there's that. But a thing I experienced a few years ago that was very moving was uh, I was at the Sacra Liturgia Conference in um, New York City in 2015, I think. And uh, I had been fortunate. A seminary exposed me to a lot of great things liturgically. I was able to you know, celebrate Mass and, and be part of a very beautiful liturgical um, experience. But I went to this with relatively low expectations, honestly, Paul, I was thinking, okay, it's going to be a bunch of academic lectures, which is fine. I, I enjoy these things, mm-hmm. but I'm also looking to be moved by the feast of faith, like, you know, to really see the outflowing of that come to life. And we had a procession in New York city in the uh, kind of upper man, maybe mid Manhattan from, um, I don't even remember which church we started uh, St. Vincent Ferrer, I think is where we ended. Mm -hmm. which is, I mean, unto itself is like a Gothic masterpiece in the middle of New York City. But what struck me was here we are processing between 7 and 8, 15 p.m. in the middle of July. It's hot. It's New York. It's just concrete city everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the devotion of the bystanders. So we're not going through an area that's particularly heavily Catholic. We're not going with the most secular city in America, right? And the people who were walking out of restaurants and out of their stores and out of their homes and just stopped dead in their tracks, Hmm. the police who had their horses laid down, like I thought that was the coolest thing. Like the horse, the horse was probably, you know, padded and like got in that position. But the fact that everybody there knew someone, not just something, but someone very important was amongst us. And that was our Lord in the Eucharist. So that was a moment of like, beautiful Eucharistic faith, just externally expressed and externally appreciated for New York city to shut down four or five blocks for this procession for that, that amount of time. And to see the reverence of people who weren't Catholic, but just knew something important is going on here. I thought that was a miracle. Yeah, Uh, that is beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick this up here in a, in a moment, because I'm going to ask you about kind of the world we live in now. And, and I do, I, it's, that does speak to me because I think that we do live in an age where people are searching for beauty and mm-hmm. like they know, and maybe they can't articulate it, but they feel that they're missing it, that we're, right. we've lost something beautiful in our modern world with everything else going on. But let me, let me kind of go back to like the first communion story and young mm. people. And you had mentioned that, and I had actually been, I'd been introduced to um, a blessed from uh, our church tradition. Her name is Blessed Imelda Lambertini. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure if you've heard of her, but Mm -hmm. I believe she was 11 years old when she passed away. Like she died of joy receiving her first communion. Right. Like she was just so overcome with first, you know, so when you're telling me that story, it just kind of, it reminded me of, of, Blessed Imelda. And it's like, man, if I could, if I could just scratch the surface of right. that kind of response, I mean, I would be hitting it on all cylinders. That's just awesome. But right. Well, so, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some of your outreach to young people. You know, in the past, you'd been the, the director of youth formation, and now you're the chaplain at the St. Philip Institute of Catechesis and Evangelization. Also, you you regularly serve at the Pines Catholic Camp, which is a, it's a well-known camp uh, in East Texas. Catholic youth from across America come to it. And, you know, I've been out there myself with my kids when you've said mass and, and all yeah. that. And so, so kind of drawing on those experiences, what have you found to be effective in teaching young people about the Eucharist? Yeah, I, I think there's a, uh, there's a little a fun way to interact with with young people. I, I had the good fortune. I was my first assignment was at a, at the cathedral in Tyler. We had a, a grade school K through five, so 
right there. I was chaplain at our high school. I was director of uh, vocations and I did campus ministry. So, you know, my whole priesthood really in eight years has been consumed with working with young people and continues to, to be so. But one of the, the, the ways in which creatively, I think you can reach young people. And I think the, the Pines is an exceptionally good example of this is that you just have to do it, Paul. Like if you want to teach a kid about the Eucharist, the what, that that's going to take on, you need to find good anecdotes like St. Imelda or Blessed Imelda, Blessed Andre Bissett, you know, to, to, to find these, these living examples that people can look at and say, uh, are th these heroic examples and say, that's worth imitating, right? Mm -hmm. But the what, you know, the, the Eucharistic theology, the, the, the theology of transubstantiation, uh, all those things in their due time and due place. But what I, I found most, most helpful was the doing of the thing. So having Eucharistic adoration at the center of parish life, at, of youth ministry. Like if you're, if you're running youth ministry in this country and, or anywhere and you don't frequently take your kids to adore the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle or in the monstrance, you're doing them a great disservice because teaching faith through your actions is extremely effective. But I do, there's a particular gospel passage that I, I, I find every summer, it only happens in cycle B, which will mean next summer it'll come up. But um, we go through the bread of life discourse in the gospel of John every, every, every year, really through the daily readings, you actually hit it most, most of the time, but summer Sundays during uh, year B, you're going to run into this. So again, I'm just going to quote a little bit of scripture here to give the context. It's John chapter chapter 6, 60 through 68. It's a little longer, but so it starts, then many of his disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew what his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the twelve, do you also want to leave me? And here's where I, where I really get into it with the kids is Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Our kids are intuitive. You know, they, they're in, their instincts actually, I think, are actually decently formed to know that there's more to the world than what you see. There's, I think it was Transformers. There's more than meets the eye, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and so they have this instinct to know that there's more to what's going on around them. But, but as you were talking about, and we'll talk a little bit more about later, is culturally, they're, they're all over the roadmap. I mean, they're on TikTok, they're on, you know, Instagram, they're on all kinds of things that distract them from anything that's actually life giving. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about the ability to encounter that with the person of our Lord in the Eucharist, that means something to them. We can say to them, you're looking for that answer. You're, you want to know whom it is you're seeking. And here he is before you in the Eucharist. Talk to him, talk to him, talk to him. But I, I'd say one other just mini, mini apologetic on, on the Eucharist that's really, that is effective because kids love science, right? Kids kind of love sci-fi, fantasy. Hit them with the miracles. I mean, my gosh. Mm -hmm. When they hear that a miracle, it, the miracles that it's heart tissue, it's, it's even heart tissue under duress mm -hmm. uh, that perfectly fits with a Middle Eastern man of 2,000 years. Like, they just can't get that out of their mind. They're like, oh, that's, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's something I can at least begin to discover maybe more. And then you lead them into the faith. Maybe the reason is what gets them there first, and they go into it with the, the eyes of faith. Mm. So kind of talking about, you know, once you start getting there, getting them there, uh, mm. I had watched, you had done a, a video with Doug Barry back in December of 2019 on the Eucharist, yeah. uh, I think as part of the St. Philip Institute. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that you said that really resonated with me, you, you kind of talk, you were talking about the mass and how it's not about your feelings, meaning like, mm -hmm. like Father Justin is not there saying mass to try to make you the congregation feel good, right? It's not about 
And it's not about going to get something, but rather to give something. Can you know? Can you elaborate on that uh, for us a little yeah. bit? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. And thanks for listening to that that podcast. That was uh, that was at the beginning of our uh, our year on the Eucharist, and we'll visit about that a little bit. But mm-hmm. you know, fundamentally, we we live in a non-Catholic culture. Uh, overwhelmingly, we live in, in a Protestant America as Christians, and uh, growing up with many of them as good friends and still are good friends, it's service. You go to service. You go, you go to receive something. If I'm going to be served by somebody like the, the uh, waiter at the restaurant, I'm going to receive something. So even that, that language culture that's around it is different. Mass, you know, the mass is, it's both the sacrifice and the meal. But what it stems from fundamentally, and we say this, we say this in the preface dialogue, right? We say it is right and just. It is right and just to honor and adore and worship God. The first three commandments, that's what they're about. If you get those three wrong, the next six or the next seven, I'm sorry, don't really matter. They really, and we say six because two of them are almost the same thing, but uh, (laughs) they really don't matter. Like if I can't fundamentally adore, love, worship, and honor God, my ability to, to, to clothe the, the naked, to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, it's out the window. My ability to respect my parents, the ability to get, have chastity in my life. Like, mm-hmm. again, I might be able to claw my way through it, kind of. Mm-hmm. But if I don't fundamentally understand that I, that I need God and I need to adore God for God's sake, uh, I'm at a great disadvantage. So worship, first and foremost, is a matter of justice. It's a matter of justice. We owe to God everything because he's given us everything. Mm-hmm. And that shouldn't be a burden. Like when somebody showers you with gifts, right? Which I, I know as an adult male, you, that's rare. But your wife, you know, on your birthday, your kids on your birthday, they shower you with gifts. They, mm-hmm. Paul, you don't say, oh, I deserve this. No, you return that love tenfold if you can. Mm-hmm. And what do you think our God does with our worship? He doesn't need it. He doesn't, it doesn't make him greater. But in turn, out of the response of love to our own love, Mm -hmm. he pours even more into us. He gives us the ability to be sanctified. So I think that's the principle biblically. I think there's also a very natural element to this. Anthropologically, what have people done since the beginning of the human being, since Homo homo sapiens? We have sought out a way to worship God. It's taken on a lot of forms. (laughs) and Even today, it still has many manifestations. But Mankind is hardwired to find our creator and to love him and to thank him and to adore him. So I think underneath all of that, and that's that, that, that even that question of, you know, feeling good, mm-hmm. that's, that's the issue. It, it, you know, sorry, grandma, sorry, you know, 12 year old, sorry, 48 year old, whoever you are. The mass is not about making you feel good. The mass is about giving thanks and an adoration to God for the sacrifice of his son that his son died on the cross for our sins and continues to pour forth his life into us through the gift of the Eucharist. So we go there not to receive the good vibes, but actually to worship our Lord. And what's crazy, again, because our Lord is just so generous, Mm -hmm. he gives us himself. We do receive the greatest gift of all, the gift of the Blessed Trinity in the Eucharist, the, the life of grace. But to move people away from that sense of feeling, Mm -hmm. I think we need to kind of reestablish the primacy of justice, that it is owed to God. Yes. And that's not a cold thing to say. Like, that's that's just true. We owe it to our Lord to say thanks Um, and to move away from the idea of going to the mass for entertainment or feel good vibes and understand that I'm going to give God worship and I need to be fed. And so that means good liturgy, beautiful liturgy, good vestments, good music, reverence homilies that actually mean something and are not just love, 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 um, that we, we need to be intentional about creating a culture of worship. And the catechism talks about this. The Eucharist, the Mass, is the privileged place of catechesis. The privileged place of catechesis. So we are going to receive good food if we're going there with dispositions that are uh, oriented towards loving our Lord. So I hope that helps. No, no, absolutely. And I think that, you know, what we see is when we kind of, we focus on what is our experience of the mass, you know, Mm -hmm. is the music, is it, is it great? Or is it kind of the music a little off tone? Is the priest, you know, 
how inspiring is he you know is right. it, you know, all that if we start kind of focused on the trappings then it, it undercuts our ability or it takes it takes our eyes off of us focusing on the reality of the real presence i remember there's uh, he's he's a young priest now but as a seminarian one of our um one of our uh seminarians was saying that he 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 even just he wanted some time for us to have mass like out outside like mm-hmm. like you know behind the church just so people would remember it's not about the building but it's about the sacrifice of the mass and so right so this next this next question i'm gonna i'm gonna give it a little bit of a preference just to kind of to build on that and give some context but you know we kind of alluded to it when we were talking about the Eucharistic procession in New York and about how people, they just kind of instinctively knew something beautiful was afoot, something important was happening. But, you know, we live in an age where more and more people declare in one way or another, you know, that they're spiritual, but they're not religious. And in fact, I, I myself, I'm, I'm sure I've used that, that exact wording when I was a young man. Yeah. And if I'm being honest, I think it was just just justifying a lack of rigor in my spiritual <laughs> supernatural life to be like, well, I don't need to go to church. Yeah, I believe in God. You know, so right. I, I think it was just a shortcut. But they tend to avoid, you know, organized <clears throat> religion and its trappings. And, you know, of course, <clears throat> that mindset keeps them from attending mass and encountering the Eucharist. And uh, now, you know, we're, you know, we're positing the Eucharist is more than just a ritual. You know, obviously right. it's about being invited to and entering deeply into a loving relationship with a real person who is present, right. Jesus Christ. But of course, it's important also to maintain the sanctity of the sacred space. So, right. you know, reverences do like you use the word justice, right? It is just for us to treat it well. So for those who might take a kind of more casual approach to the spiritual life, what would you say to them about why orthodoxy is so important when it comes to the Eucharist? Yeah, I appreciate this uh, question, and even the the preface there is is helpful. The spiritual, but not religious. Like that's an axiom that the nuns of America, that not the the, the habited nuns, but the N O N E S, those who don't self identify with any religious practice. Mm-hmm. Bishop Barron talks a lot about these these people. Um, I do think that there is an incredible amount of moralistic uh, justification, moral justification for that, that I don't want to conform my life to Christ. Mm-hmm. I don't want to conform Christ or God or whatever to my life so that you become your own God. I mean, it's just the most lazy kind of approach that you can imagine. I think that's real. Now, I do think there are serious discerning people, don't get me wrong, who are out there who really have just run into maybe bad examples of organized religion. They've been part of a church life, whether Catholic or not, that really just rubbed them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they they feel disaffected by that community. But we have to kind of always remember at the center of all of this conversation, right, is not the external trappings. It's the person of Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, I mean, the Eucharist itself is the presence of our Lord sacramentally, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so to speak to that, that notion that people are thirsting and longing for something beautiful, the via pulchritidinis, the, the way of beauty that Dostoevsky says in the book, The Idiot, beauty will save the world. Like, what are people looking for? Well, we, I look at the axiom of St. Thomas Aquinas, the soul animates the body. Like, this is, this is about our anthropology, right? Mm-hmm. So we're body and soul. We can't say that you, you can't distinguish these things, separate them in such a way that because uh, then you don't have a full human person. You you have a corpse or you have a, a pure spirit, right? So we're body and soul. That means we are created in, in a way in which those two two the things are interacting at all times and are united essentially. Um, so we look at, again to, to scripture, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, we're created in the image and likeness of God, which fundamentally means two things. We're cr- created in an orderly fashion because God is ordered. God is I mean, he he embodies and is order itself. Mm-hmm. So we're created in an orderly way. And secondly, that we're created into a community because even the Hebrew words themselves suggest in a, in a kind of anticipatory way, the blessed Trinity say we're created in our image and likeness. Mm-hmm. Um, and so mankind is created for order and for community. What does this mean? This means that your experience as a spiritual person is ordered 
towards a communion of persons. And so the idea that you can be spiritual without religion means that you're spiritual without a community, which defies the way in which you were actually created. And so, again, we look to like scripture, Acts 2.42, that we see the community that, that broke bread, it's an allusion to the Eucharist, uh, shared things in common and distributed their goods and their alms to the poor. That was a spiritual community, uh, a very nascent early Catholic church doing the best they could within the community of believers they had themselves. And it's very clear, Paul, right, from the letters of St. Paul, mm -hmm. that there were fractions in this community. There were people who were bad actors, but we can't put the bad actors in the way of the center of this, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just always try to refer people when they have this kind of conversation, go look at John chapter 15. Look at John chapter 15. It's the vine and the branches. Our Lord says many great things in, in this part of, of sacred scripture. One thing that jumps out is no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Mm -hmm. You are my friends. If you do it, I command you. I no longer call you slaves but I call you friends. But he's saying that to a community of believers. He's saying that to a group of disciples, that you will see me, in a sense, lay down my life for you out of love for you. But I'm doing this for you as individuals and as a community. So remain in that community. Remain in the vine. You are the branches, remain in the vine. So the vine is sometimes what we lose sight of because the branches, the people become distractions, popes, saints, theologians, bad priests, good priests, mm -hmm. all become reasons for us to say yes or no to God. You're saying yes or no to people in that instance, mm -hmm. not to God, but you need to be rooted in the community that Christ has established in the church. You know, kind of taking that in a, a local way. Uh, I understand that the Diocese of Tyler has declared a year of the Eucharist for the 2020 liturgical year. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that and how you see the fruit of that at work in your parish? Yeah, so Bishop Strickland is our uh, our local ordinary. And he's, uh, many people know him uh, from his Twitter account, uh, but hopefully you've also read his teaching constitution. I would recommend to your audience especially um, to read his teaching constitution because he, he had a, a very, has continues to be inspired, but had a very inspired vision of understanding that what the church's desire at this moment in time, as we've been kind of living in this new evangelization conversation, mm -hmm. what the church really is desiring, and you see it in the documents themselves, is we need to better accompany families and individuals to be united to our Lord. And so Bishop Strickland, keenly aware of that from kind of an intellectual and mission level, was reading deeply and is still reading it back through it is in sinew yesu a great book i've read a number of i know a number of priests for anybody it's it, particularly for priests it's very edifying but for anybody i think you find great edification it's a, from a benedictine monk uh, who's who's alive and check it out but what he desired what bishop strickland and i i talked to him pretty regularly about this because i work with him so much is that we just need to kind of focus on our lord in the eucharist itself uh, himself, uh, to realize that's a person. And you, if you listen to Bishop Strickland talk about this, he says it all the time. It's not an it, it's a who. Mm -hmm. um, the Eucharist is about the person and is the person of our Lord. And to kind of really put the whole context of the year in that, that mold, like what does that look like? COVID happened. <laughs> and, you know, nobody could have predicted that. Mm -hmm. uh, but even in that, there were some great fruits. You know, we saw that overwhelmingly nationwide, churches were shut down for a while. They've been open in Texas and especially in Tyler Diocese for a long time now, but people had to go online. You had to watch TV, you had to watch a mass online. But Bishop Strickland did something and kind of at the beginning, I did it here in Texarkana. I know a number of priests. We just went outside with our Lord in the, in the, in the monstrance and stood on a street corner. I'm in Texarkana, Texas, like very small part of our diocese on the rural north, northeast side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over 16,000 people watched that short video about me just standing around with our Lord on a street corner. Bishop did it, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of people watched it. He's a bishop. But, mm -hmm. you know, the idea is that we've got to we've got to bring Christ to the people mm -hmm. in the Eucharist and, and invite people in. So we've seen a lot happening in parishes and the diocese. But for us, particularly here at Sacred Heart, and I, and I will say there's a few other parishes who have done this, but 
Well, we've really taken to heart in this year of the Eucharist has been three things. One, we have daily adoration Monday through Friday from three o'clock to four o'clock. And Father Adams and I, he's the pastor. He and I are in there every day. If anybody needs to go to confession, they can go to confession. We pray the chaplet at three. We pray the rosary kind of towards the end of the hour. But in the middle is 30 to 34 minutes of just solid silence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Paul, I can't tell you how much fruit I've seen from that. It, it's, it fluctuates, but it, at its maximal, we see sometimes up to 40 or 50 people. And at minimum, still like seven to eight people mm -hmm. during the work week. And we do it on Sundays and we've been doing it on Sundays for a couple of years, but that's, that's one particular fruit. And, you know, I, I know one of the other priests on this show talked to the thing was father Richards. And I, I agree with him. Like adoration chapels need to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have a, another parish that's 2.3 miles away that has perpetual adoration. So mm -hmm. people have the opportunity to go there, but, but this, this emphasis on the Eucharist trying to increase that. The second thing is, we're offering the extraordinary form. We've been doing that every week, a low mass on Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, but we've, we've basically gotten to the point where we're doing about a, every quarter, we're doing a solemn high mass. And that's another avenue in which we're introducing people to the beauty of the church. We have great musicians here and giving them a different expression of the Roman rite that they can pray through. And, and that's, you know, we just had a solemn requiem mass this past Thursday that was phenomenal. You can find it on Sacred Heart's Facebook page, but that's been a new avenue and it's kind of expanded our, our horizons for people who aren't necessarily parishioners, but want that, that ritual and to, to see that happen. Um, but I'd say that the most important thing that we did here, um, and this is mildly controversial in the United States because it, it always raises some yellow flags we pray mass at Orientum every day. We began the process of formation for this last fall. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a, an 11 week series on the liturgy with our parishioners. Uh, we had a class on Tuesday nights. We, we preached about it for about six weeks in a row. And we, I, I had bulletin inserts every week. And mm -hmm. So on the feast there, the Salonity of Christ the King, which is the week before the Eucharistic year of reverence started, we had moved to all of our daily and Sunday masses would be done in uh, ad deum or towards God. And nobody left the church. Mm -hmm. No disaffected individual, you know, was throwing, you know, rocks through our windows or yelling at us for being pre-Vatican II. Mm -hmm. because we took the time to form them to give them the, the chance to ask questions and to understand the why mm -hmm. and once the why was clear really paul it's just been smooth sailing and it, it's funny now because we're, we're what eight months into that nine months into that mm -hmm. and most of our people can't even remember mass versus Paul with us looking they're like oh i kind of forgot about that that's because they've seen the beauty of it they're mm -hmm. not they don't feel like father has his back turned towards me they feel like father's leading me towards God, which is the whole thing. Like I'm praying and I say, God, our heavenly father. I don't say Joseph, Mary, Jim, you know, Winona or whatever your names are. Cause if I'm looking at you and praying to God, that's a weird conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So just physical orientation and seeing that reverence. Um, when you come to Sacred Heart in Texarkana, which I hope you do sometime, you'll see, you know, 80% of our people receive communion on the tongue. And it's not because they're trying to prove that they're so holy. It's because they truly believe our Lord is present in the Eucharist and they want to worship and honor their King. I get excited about this stuff. <laughs> no, it's, and it's beautiful because, you know, as, as you're talking about it, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, you know, one, one way to think about it is like, you know, your priest is your ship's captain and he is leading mm -hmm. you to, you know, he's leading you to the safe shores, which is Jesus Christ. Right. Right. And so, you know, kind of think about it, you know, he, he, you want him looking toward Christ. You don't want him looking back to the transom at the back of the boat, right? You want him to look at where you're going, not where you've been. And so, right, right. And uh, I always just real quick on that, that I, I like that there's a meme out there that shows a, a bus driver, mm -hmm. right? The bus driver's at the front of the bus and looking ahead so that you don't run into the, any, any other cars or any obstacles that they know where they're going to stop. But the bus drivers sometimes, I remember because I was a kid, had to look over their shoulder real quickly and yell and say, sit down and shut up, right? <laughs> um, you know, the priest during mass, when he is facing, you know, the tabernacle or the crucifix, 
-hmm. He does turn. He does turn. He turns at the points where he needs to invite you in. He says, the Lord be with you. He's facing you because that's a dialogue, right? right? But the parts where he's praising God and praying to God, it it, it doesn't make sense. So he'll look back and give directions occasionally, but then he's looking forward because he needs to keep his eyes on the road. Mm -hmm. We're going towards the shores of God, as you said, in in this, this boat. If I'm always looking back, then I have no idea that I'm about to run into the lighthouse in front of me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we could probably spend a whole podcast just talking about that and about how it's, you know, where's the focus truly. But, well, let me ask you, um, so my my last question for you for today is around a favorite saint. And I I like to do this with my guests because, you know, everybody has a saint that they feel they have a personal affinity to and their stories yeah. about that. And so I love to, I love to hear those. So what saint do you have a particular devotion to and why, and what has he or she meant for your priesthood and how has he or she been instructional in your relationship to Christ in the Eucharist? Yeah, man, when you sent this question, it's like, hey, can I sit <laughs> list, list like 15, but no, I, I want to focus on one particularly because it also pays tribute to my vocation. Uh, St. Peter Julian Imard, uh, mm-hmm. he's called the Apostle of the Eucharist, right? He founded the congregation or the Society for uh, Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, the Blessed Sacrament Fathers. I was very fortunate as a teenager when I was like 13 or 14 that my parish in Longview, Texas at St. Mary's got a Blessed Sacrament Father for a couple of years. His name's Father Denzel Bithanagi. He is just the nicest and most joy-filled priest. I mean, literally, he can be getting punched in the face and he's smiling mm. um, because he has such a deep and profound love for our Lord in the Eucharist. So really, it was his example mm. um, that inspired me in a lot of ways in the, my to, to follow this vocation. But what he did was he, he said nothing profound. He just said, go to adoration. Go to adoration. He told my mom, bring Justin to adoration. And so at 14, there I am sitting before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, getting that exposure to our Lord's presence. And so over the years now, I've had a chance to read St. Peter Julian Amard and go back to his writings frequently when maybe I'm in a dry spell and, and need that deep touch of Eucharistic piety that, that he's so well displayed in his writings. But I'd say that guy's up there uh, in many ways because of his example, but to be remembered as the apostle of the Blessed Sacrament just even those words really inspire me as a priest. Like, what will what will the people of God remember me for in Sacred Heart Texture Canada? I don't care if they love my homilies were great or that my beard was nice or whatever. <laughs> I hope and pray. Mm-hmm. I genuinely hope and pray, Paul, that they say, Father could frequently be found loving our Lord in the tabernacle. Mm. What yeah. a joy that would be. What a great legacy. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, hey, will you, uh, would you be so kind as to pray us out? Absolutely. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Loving Father, this day as we celebrate the dedication of the Basilica of St. Mary Major, that church of great historical repute dedicated to Our Lady, we ask for her intercession, Mother Mary, that you will watch over us, help us to have a Eucharistic heart as your heart in your womb our Eucharistic, first tabernacle of the world. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm so glad to have spent this time with Father Justin talking about our Lord. Having had the privilege of attending Masses where Father Justin was the celebrant, as well as having known him personally for several years, I am just deeply impressed by how reverent and genuine he is in the administration of his priestly duties. I hope you will join me in praying for him and for all of our priests, especially our younger priests and seminarians, as they carry the church forward for future generations. St. Peter Julian Eimerd, pray for us.